Should Ukraine declare its neutrality as a way to stop the war? With fighting into a fourth week, the Kremlin is considering the neutral status compromise to stop its attacks. Will the Ukrainians surrender to the pressure from Moscow? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. It's been three weeks since Russia launched its invasion of Ukraine. Ukraine's cities are being bombarded from land, sea, and air. As the destruction worsens, the warring sides are discussing a ceasefire. Both sides are warning of significant differences, but one possibility is Ukraine declaring its neutrality like Sweden or Austria. And the Ukrainians renouncing their ambitions to join NATO, as well as promising not to host foreign military bases or weapons. In exchange, Ukraine would get protection from allies such as the U.S., Britain, and Turkey. So far, Ukraine's leaders have rejected Russia's proposals. Ukraine is now in a direct state of war with Russia. As a result, the model can only be Ukrainian and only on legally verified security guarantees. The problems which are fundamental for Russia, for our future of Ukraine's neutrality, Ukraine's demilitarization and denazification, we were and we are ready to discuss the talks. Our country did its best to organize and hold these talks, understanding that every possibility is to save people. But what we see time and again is that the Kyiv regime, which was assigned by its Western masters to create an anti-Russian offensive, is indifferent to the fate of the Ukrainian people. We'll bring in our guests in a moment. First, let's look at the timeline of tensions between Russia and Ukraine. Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union until its collapse in 1991. Since gaining independence, Ukrainians have suffered political upheaval at home and tension with Russia. In 1994, Ukraine gave up its nuclear arsenal in exchange for a commitment from Russia to respect its independence and sovereignty. Moscow has since been concerned with keeping Ukraine from joining the NATO military alliance. Mass protests eight years ago toppled President Viktor Yanukovych. That happened after he refused to sign a trade deal with European Union as he sought closer ties with Moscow. Russia's armed forces responded by annexing the Crimean Peninsula and backing a separatist rebellion in eastern Ukraine. All right, let's go ahead and bring in our guests. Joining us from outside of Kyiv in Ukraine, Peter Zelmayev, executive director of the Eurasia Democracy Initiative. That's a nonprofit organization which promotes democracy and rule of law in former communist countries. From Russia's capital, Moscow, Pavel Felgenhauer, defense and military analyst for Novaya Gazeta newspaper. And from Germany's capital, Berlin, Andreas Umland, analyst at the Stockholm Center for Eastern European Studies. That's part of the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. Thanks so much to you all for joining us. We appreciate your time today on Inside Story. Peter, let me start with you today. With all that you are seeing and experiencing on the ground there in Ukraine, when you hear that these negotiations are going on, uh, that Russia wants to see Ukraine declare its neutrality, do you think that that is something that is actually feasible right now? Well, uh, so far, going by the track record of the uh, way the Russians have communicated their intentions, I would not, uh, you know, hold my breath. You know, in the weeks running up to Russia's invasion on February 24th, uh, we heard uh, assurances almost on a daily basis that Russia had no intention of invading Ukraine. Then a few days before the actual invasion, uh, Russia announced that it was uh, withdrawing troops from Ukraine's borders, which never happened, obviously. Um, and and then we were f like fully in uh, the war situation uh, with Russia, you know, uh, having unleashed its uh, terror uh, uh, against all of Ukraine's territory, pretty much. What I'm seeing right now is, uh, you know, um, uh, I, I suspect maybe a smoke screen, smoke screen uh, for uh, Russia's real intention, and that is to regroup, to try to, uh, you know, restore its uh, morale of its fighting troops, because it's reported to be very low, uh, and to try to storm Kiev. 
uh, a second time. It's simply uh, un- not feasible for me right now to imagine that Vladimir Putin would be withdrawing his troops and then claiming the already existing status quo in Ukraine as a victory. You know, there's a sunk cost fallacy where, you know, having expended this much blood and treasure, Vladimir Putin mm-hmm. would probably think of that kind of scenario as tantamount to his political or even physical death. So I'm skeptical, even though I do believe that eventually some sort of a compromise diplomatically must be found in order for this to stop. Andreas, it's being reported that Ukraine and Russia are making progress on some type of potential ceasefire. Do you think that this is achievable? It will depend on the assessment of the so-called correlational forces in Moscow, uh, how uh, Moscow will uh, assess the uh, continuing costs and risks of this confrontation with Ukraine and also the associated costs and risks in, um, for its economy because of the sanctions. Um, that is very difficult to say how this assessment um, goes, but it also clearly depends on Western measures on the degree of sanctions, uh, the degree of military support uh, for Ukraine. Uh, but I would not exclude that at some point, maybe not now, we, we may come to this point and then um, the exact formulation of this uh, neutrality idea could come to the fore. The problem here of Ukraine is uh, not so much Russia, actually, but is rather the West uh, in that um, Ukraine has since 2008 an official membership perspective um, for, from NATO, but it has not advanced since then to this membership. Uh, uh, it has not received the membership action plan. It has entered a few additional programs of NATO, but um, in substance, nothing has actually happened. And that will probably continue this situation. And under the impression of um, of this sad story, um, Yeltsin, I'm already saying, Zelensky has um, recently indicated that he may actually be ready to negotiate this this issue about neutrality, Mm -hmm. about not any longer entering NATO. But then I think Ukraine will uh, try to get some other uh, mutual aid Mm -hmm. um, agreement from uh, from the West uh, that clearly go beyond the Budapest Memorandum of 1994. Mm -hmm. Um, It will want some sort of... uh, uh, real security assurances, real security guarantees uh, that go beyond this sort of non-aggression mm-hmm. uh, pact from 1994. Pavel, when Russia demands that Ukraine declare neutrality, what exactly does that mean? What does that mean for President Putin? What would he like to see? Uh, well, uh, the Kremlin has explained that Russia is not so much seeking uh, Ukrainian neutrality, since Ukraine is already, right now, a neutral country, uh, uh, the, officially. Uh, but that uh, Russia wants ironclad guarantees that Ukraine will never become a NATO member, or uh, and, and, uh, maybe more importantly, that Ukraine that no weapons of any sorts can appear on Ukrainian territory that could potentially threaten Russia, because as the Kremlin and the Russian president said, they can be not member of NATO, it doesn't matter, they can have anyway some American missiles or something. These American presumed missiles that right now are not really in existence, but may appear several in several years or something are a very important point for President Putin personally and for the Kremlin that's seen that they could be deployed in Ukraine and can hit targets in the Moscow area very swiftly without, say, the Russian leader should be able to become airborne or hide in a bunker or something. So that's what right now Russia wants. It wants Ukraine to be under Russian so, uh, sort of control and security matters, that Russia would have a decisive voice there. And also, of course, very important for Russia is that the new Ukrainian government or the old Ukrainian government recognize that Crimea is a part of Russia, recognize the independence of these small statelets in the Donbass. And in general, wants to, Russia wants to see Ukraine as a decentralized buffer state between itself 
-hmm. and Europe a buffer state that eventually may become, if not all of it, the big parts of it will reunify, will be in the process of gradual re mm -hmm. reunification with Russia. Peter, the last time that I spoke with you on this program, you were in a suit and tie. Uh, we were talking about uh, potential diplomatic moves. Things were very different for you and for so many other Ukrainians. I'm, I'm speaking to you today. You're wearing camouflage. I, I've heard you in various interviews talk about wanting to uh, take up the fight. Um, from your perspective, if President Zelensky were to cede to these demands, if Ukraine were to declare itself neutral, how would you and how would so many other Ukrainians take that? That's a very, it's a million hryvna question, you know, or a million ruble question, if you will. Uh, the neutrality idea in and of itself is not uh, necessarily a negative one for Ukraine. There's the, uh, the much maligned term Finlandization does not necessarily have to be. So Finland has turned out to be quite well, one of the most prosperous, least corrupt nations on the planet. So uh, now, as uh, you mentioned, there's a model of Austria being discussed, Sweden, all of them are good and well. The question is, once you demilitarize Ukraine, that's the extension of neutrality, Pavel just mentioned it, then what sort of security guarantees could you rely on uh, in, you know, uh, having um, mm, the precedent of 1994 when the Budapest Memorandum was signed, uh, as you also mentioned in the lead up to this conversation, uh, and Russia clearly did not feel, uh, you know, beholden to it since 2014. Uh, it's, it's been this long kind of... Uh, one long period of aggression against Ukraine. Uh, so that is one uh, element to consider. The second element of this is uh, whether Vladimir, uh, Vladimir, Zel Vladimir Zelensky has the mandate to promise uh, Vladimir Putin anything such as signing off on the Russian sovereignty over Crimea and the eastern Ukraine. Putin knows this, and that's why he's sort of trying to box Ukrainians into the corner, knowing that the street, the Maidan, you know, may uh, force Zelensky out of power, especially now that Ukraine in its fourth week has expended so much blood and treasure fighting off the world's second largest army to sign off on something like this was very, very risky for Zelensky. So uh, uh, once again, you know, Ukraine understands there, there will have to be some sort of a formula worked out. I think it's already come pretty close to uh, acknowledging that NATO will be uh, pretty much uh, uh, a no-go zone, meaning, you know, it's ready to sort of part with the idea of ever joining NATO. But in the absence of NATO, there has to be some sort of ironclad security guarantee by several parties, uh, Turkey, U.S. have been mentioned, uh, to where Ukraine would feel confident, you know, that it could do that. Pavel, um, we all know how difficult it is when a ceasefire is declared in certain situations to ensure that the situation on the ground can be stabilized. That's a very different kind of matter. So I want to ask you, if a ceasefire is declared, if these negotiations um, get to the point where there is some kind of a truce, could the situation on the ground be stabilized? Uh, at present, I don't believe that's possible. It's a kind of salami situation with Ukrainians and Russians intermixed troops, I mean, in different parts of uh, Ukraine, there's uh, five Russian offensives happening. Uh, there's no straightforward uh, front line. One, uh, and kind of maintaining a ceasefire there is virtually impossible. A ceasefire could be only if it's immediate uh, withdrawal of Russian troops or Ukrainian surrendering. I mean, it should be followed almost immediately by measures to decouple the, uh, the fighting people from both sides. And that's right now the problem, because a Russian withdrawal, say it's Ukraine is demanding an uh, antebellum withdrawal to the positions of uh, 24th of February this year, which most likely Russia won't take. And any kind of Russia keeping some kind of pieces that it has already taken, that would mean that there's going to be more fighting uh, right now, I don't really see a ceasefire or an agreement emerging. Both sides are talking about wanting to have it because everyone wants peace. Uh, no one wants to be the bad villain who says no peace, sorry. 
Uh, but in fact, the positions of the two sides right now are almost incompatible. I'm afraid that there's going to be continued bloodshed for the time being. It's going to be decided for the time being, not by diplomats, but by soldiers fighting with arms in the field. Andreas, I just want to take a step back for a moment and see if you could try to walk our viewers through just how big a geopolitical shift is happening, especially in Europe right now, as a result of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I think it's a fundamental shift uh, that goes far beyond the uh, East European uh, region. Um, Russia is going to be a very different actor afterwards. I think the EU is going to change. NATO is going to change. Um, the biggest change that I see and the saddest change is that to the um, international regime for the prevention of the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Because the most scandalous, perhaps, aspect of this entire conflict is that um, it's defined, of course, by um, the presence of nuclear weapons on the Russian side and the absence of nuclear weapons on the Ukrainian side. And the scandal here is that Russia is, does not only have nuclear weapons, it is also explicitly allowed to have nuclear weapons by the uh, non Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And Ukraine is, it does not only not have nuclear weapons, but it's also explicitly forbidden to have nuclear weapons. And the most grotesque aspect of this is, of course, that, U that Ukraine was for a short period of time um, in the early 1990s, um, the third uh, largest nuclear weapon state of the, of the world and had more nuclear ammunition and warheads than China, France and Great Britain uh, together. It could not control most of these weapons, but anyway, it had a, a huge uh, arsenal back then gave it uh, away, gave it to Russia, and uh, 20 years later, with the annexation of Crimea, mm -hmm. um, uh, it, was, it was punished for this. And this is going to make um, actors and politicians and experts, diplomats around the world, not only in Europe uh, or in Asia, but around the world, mm -hmm. think twice about their security, about the validity of international law, mm -hmm. about how they can protect themselves and how they may also be able to snatch um, a, a territory that they want to get from a neighboring country. Peter, despite the repeated pleas from President Zelensky and so many other Ukrainians, NATO has continued to refuse uh, imposing a no-fly zone over Ukraine. Do you think that at some point that might change, that pressure would build so substantially um, from possibly even within NATO member states, that there could be a shift in that stance? Many of us are, are tempted to speculate on that. And one has to be careful not to be uh, to, 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 to come across as a warmonger, because we all understand the implications <clears throat> of the war no zone. We understand the Europeans' concern, the global concern, that that would lead to a direct confrontation with a nuclear power. Uh, so having said that, I would say that uh, following the logic of this escalation, and once again, serious questions about the rationality of Vladimir Putin, who has spent two years in a bunker, uh, hiding from COVID and apparently now hiding from his own officials, uh, uh, possibly uh, uh, afraid of a, an assassination attempt, one may wonder if he is, uh, is still with us in this realm and in this world, rather than a world of his own invention. And so, uh, you know, this is a very dangerous uh, moment. Obviously, no one wants to escalate any further. But at the same time, there is an understanding on the part of, the, of, of NATO and the U.S., that a fight for Ukraine is something larger than a fight just for Ukraine's sovereignty. It's a fight for the Western credibility and legitimacy. Having said that, you know, you, uh, what's the next best option? The next best option is for NATO to enable Ukrainians to try to enforce their own semblance of a no-fly zone uh, with uh, air, uh, air defense systems, with uh, anti-tank missiles, and yes, with uh, fighter jets, something that mm -hmm. uh, Poland and U.S. have come very close to deciding on. There's a snafu now. I think Zelensky's speech to Congress yesterday was a very serious uh, contribution to that decision being made, considering that uh, Joe, Joe Biden is now under pressure from the opposition and from members of his own party mm -hmm. to deliver on uh, the promise uh, to Ukrainians. 
Pavel, if Russia were to manage to take Kyiv, what exactly does that mean? Uh, does that mean that there is no more chance for diplomacy? Does that mean there's automatic regime change? Does that mean negotiations continue? What happens if that were to occur? I don't think that Russia has right now the capacity to actually uh, successfully take Kyiv. It's a very big city, and the Russian forces that are there uh, to the north of the city are just simply not big enough. Uh, but Russia can bombard uh, Kyiv, which not, didn't do up to now, but it can begin a kind of siege and a bombardment. Uh, which would make life very miserable and very dangerous in Kiev. Uh, again, I'm not sure that that's right now going to happen immediately. It seems that the Russian m main military uh, thrust is going to be to do all possible to swiftly mm -hmm. capture uh, Mariupol and maybe put more pressure on Nikolai. Russia is right now running uh, low on reserves, so, and actually moving more forces to uh, north of Kiev. I mean, we, maybe if they had them, they can't keep them there. They're uh, very enormous logistical problems, especially with those uh, paratroopers that are deployed there. So I don't think Kiev right now is on the cards. Of course, things may change uh, if political decisions are made in Russia. But nothing, uh, but a bombardment is possible. Uh, an effective, a, a swift offensive to take the city, not. Mm. It's, I mean, it's bigger than Mosul, and it would take, I mean, I don't know, uh, uh, months, a year maybe, mm -hmm. to go through it and turn it into a pile of total rubble and then take it and liberate it that way. I don't think Russia is ready for that. I don't think it has the capacity. Andreas, from your vantage point, is there any acceptable off-ramp to the conflict that can be offered to President Putin right now? I don't think that it actually de depends that much on what is offered, because my, uh, my impression from the Russian propaganda machine that it can basically provide this sort of off-ramp for Putin in almost any way. If there's any concession that Ukraine can make, symbolic or non-symbolic, that will that could potentially be uh, already enough for uh, for Putin to withdraw, if he wants to withdraw. That's, I think, the, the crucial question. And as I said, uh, for that, um, the costs and risks of this entire operation will have to raise. And um, the West is the only, uh, the only actor that can raise these costs by imposing more severe sanctions, by del delivering heavier uh, weapons. Um, and uh, I agree here with Peter that uh, maybe Ukraine does not even need a, a no-fly zone imposed by NATO. What it just need, needs is um, the right material, the, mm -hmm. the right weapons, perhaps also volunteers, um, uh, uh, veterans, mm -hmm. war veterans or army veterans from perhaps not only NATO countries that would come to the International Legion mm -hmm. of um, Ukraine that already exists and would then operate and and provide the logistic support for, let's right. say, um, anti-aircraft weapons. Uh, Peter, we only have about a minute left. I just want to ask you very quickly, um, are you hearing from fellow Ukrainians any sense of hope that the negotiations that are going on right now might actually yield some kind of meaningful ceasefire or end to the conflict? Uh, I, I don't think the Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainians now that I talk with are putting any uh, of their hopes in uh, diplomatic uh, in a process. They're putting their hopes in the resolve that the Ukrainians have shown to fight for their country uh, and to fight against the enemy. Uh, this is as black and white as conflicts go. Mm -hmm. uh, and the sort of national mobilization I've seen and the rise of national spirit is unlike anything Ukraine has known since the 1940s, since World War II. All right. Well, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Thank you so much to all of our guests, Peter Zalmayev, Pavel Felgenhauer, and Andreas Umland. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now.